Salutations, uh, my name is Stefan van Grieg, and I'm going to do a presentation about PowerShell classes entitled Learning Classes Without Class. So first of all, uh, we wanted to say thank you to all the partners and uh, the sponsors for uh, this very special edition of the PowerShell Conference 2020. Of course, you're probably aware that uh, because of the Corona situation, extra, extra, um, unfortunately, the, the live event was canceled, but luckily we have uh, an online event happening in a few days and uh, we have the possibility to watch uh, all the content directly on, on the internet, which is, which is great. So this talk, as, um, as I mentioned, is going to be about classes and uh, we're going to go through the agenda and talk about the following points. We're going to, I'm going to explain to you like the expectations you can have of this talk, um, what will you learn um, by going through this, uh, this talk, this video actually, this recorded video. Um, basically I'm going to explain all the errors and all the stuff I have done to to get really uh, the full understanding of classes that I have today. Uh, simply because it's maybe not that straightforward for any sysadmin or system engineer, uh, which has maybe not, you know, done some advanced programming classes in university or so. And so maybe this thing will, uh, this talk will uh, fill those gaps. Um, hopefully it, it it does because myself had these issues and I kind of wanted to do this this talk for that particular reason. So we're gonna learn how to swim. So basically how to, uh, so understanding the basics um, um, of classes and you know, how, what do we do uh, to avoid to drown? Then we want to, uh, we're gonna really like just jump in the cold water I'm going to go through the first project I've done, created. Um, so we're going to look at the, how I applied actually the different concepts of classes in real projects. And we're going to look at, you know, the things I did wrong at the time. So co code is still live, by the way, so we can still see those mistakes. And uh, at the very end, we're going to see how we can go and convert an existing script to a class and so uh, an existing old script of mine. So that, that's going to be live. So the expectations. First, uh, we're gonna go uh, redefine what an object is just to, so that everybody is at the same level. I'm going to teach you the fundamental rules you need to know when uh, using classes, all the, like the, the the concepts you need to keep in mind when you're writing code and you're writing a class. I'm going to explain to you the basic vocabulary related to classes, just cover everything, what, a, what is a property, blah, 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 uh, so that everybody's on the same page. So this might be, um, this might be okay for uh, everybody, maybe not for everybody, but I just want to be sure that everybody understands it. And then at the very end, um, we are going to see uh, how to convert an old script of mine to uh, a class. Then we're going to talk a little bit uh, about if that makes sense or not, and um, how, you know what will be the best structure, extra, extra. And so through all of these talks and examples, extra, we're going to see like the failures I did and uh, like the lessons and sometimes hard lessons I've learned. Um, so learning how to swim or like learn the basics to avoid to drown. So if you want to go and swim or if you want to go into the sea and you don't know how to swim, you have like uh, a very high percentage uh, chance of drowning, except if you stay close to the shore. Um, but yeah, there, there are like some rules uh, you need to know um, to be able to swim. Right, you need to move the legs at, at the same times with the, with the hands, and if you don't do that, then you know you you have big chances to drown. 
might not you know die but you can at least you know drown a little bit so I, I want to cover with you like the, the basics so we're going to start by rediscovering what a what an object is how um how powershell actually works with objects and then we're going to talk about the vocabulary basics things like uh, what is an instantiation what is a property what is a method what is a constructor and like what is a the the this this keyword and void keyword right okay let's dive into it so i'm here in my uh, Visual Studio Code editor. I'm gonna close everything which is not this. Uh, close others. Everything which is not this class dot computer ps one, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what is an object, right? For a lot of people um, using PowerShell, everybody has actually already worked with object. Most of you guys already knew it, but there's like some things you probably didn't know, specifically if if you're like beginning with with objects, right? So let's take the the get date for example. Um, command it, which uh, shows us a date. We can actually save this into a variable called date, and here we have actually the same thing. If we pipe this to get member, we can see we have a lot of things here called property, and then we have a lot of things here called method, and then we have something here called type name. Here we have, um, we know that actually this, this information here is actually an object of type system.dateTime, and it comes with uh, like a lot of good things some good is so with some methods and some properties so you might ask what is a what is a property right so let's have a look at it we actually have our variable here date so i'm pressing f8 to show what we have in it and so if we do just dot and we go through like this, we can see we have date, day, hour, blah, blah, blah. So let's take like the month, for example, we want to see the month. We do like um, F8 here, we launch it, we see five, right? We have access to um, an information which is attached to this variable called date, which is month. So that's actually a property. We can have another property like date dot like second, for example, which is like 35. I called it at 18, 10, 35. So the intelligence in, in Visual Studio Code is, is, is pretty cool because you can see here we have two different types of of icons, we have these little uh, une clé. <laughs> Don't let's say it in English, and we have like these little boxes here. So these these clé, <laughs> these keys here, is actually what we call property. And we can see those things. These these boxes here are actually methods, right? And so what is the difference now? It's basically this thing. These properties simply show information, right? They show information. And then for methods, it is simply, they do stuff. It's action, it's work. It's basically just calling like a function, but it's attached to that variable. So basically, for example, we have add days, right? And so if we want to add days, like we want to add, I don't know, 30 days to this, like a month. Press F5, you can see here, 30th of June, 2020. So my, my system is in French. Or we can do something opposite. We can do minus 30, and we can go back a month, and here's like the 1st of May. So we have the possibility to 
to retrieve information using properties and to work, do actions on that particular meth on that particular uh, uh, variable using methods, right? So a method is actually just like a, a function and we can say that a property is kind of like a, a variable. It just contains data. Contains data. And the method, it basically does stuff. So, and one last thing actually. So, I want to cover is that this dollar date get date what we actually doing here so i'm cutting it again and now i'm showing we have date here it's 1814 and let's do date 2 equal gate get date cut it a second time we have day 2 now and so when we look at day two we can see the information is different of course it's like almost uh like half a minute further what we actually did here is we so for us we we were simply before calling just a, a function right or a command that but in reality what it's doing it's instantiating a class it's creating an instance of a class of type Um, of type of type date time right instantiation so if I sum up we have an object, get date, that everybody actually already knows. Everybody knows this commandlet. And in here we have properties. So date, hour, minute, etc. And we have methods like add days. Add year, it's probably an add year, not sure actually. Date dot add, add month, add month, for example, etc. And also, like a last precis precision is that a method is always called using those parentheses, and in those parentheses, we simply give an a value, a parameter. So let's go back to the slide. So we're back in PowerPoint. We've just rediscovered actually what objects are. So to sum up, we can see that uh, there's like three concepts here. Uh, that you guys already knew, um, you might not uh, were super aware of their names, of the vocabulary related to it. We have instantiation, it's basically just calling the, the commandlet. In, in the background, it, it, it does like something a bit more than just calling the commandlet, but let's, to keep it simple, let's leave it like that. Then we, we, we did like a dot year or dot, dot minute in the example. That's basically just calling a property it gives us information back, right? It does no calculation, it just gives it back. And uh, we also called a method uh, called add days, and um, it returned like a date, and that's basically a method. So for me, like all those things, they, they were like, I knew all those things, but when I could, when I managed to, to draw that, that line actually from that knowledge already had, like from 
get date and actually my example was not with get date but like how when it did click for me it was so not with get date but with config manager with sscm commandlets for people that have worked with it you probably know it on wmi um you can um create actually new instances of specific wmi things so packages advertisement all those things and you needed to do it with wmi at the time there was no official powershell module for uh, config manager so scm and um, at the time that was really difficult and so we had to write like complete module just for that and so basically we were doing the same thing Okay, we were creating an instance of a new package. We were we would add like properties to it, and then at the end we would do a dot create. And so it would only go and send the like the data to uh, the config manager server when you did the dot create, or actually it was dot put. But it's the let's say it's the same thing, and then it would go and implement the things in in config manager. So package with the dot name, we would give the name extra, extra. That was really my learning curve. But I think the example here is, is most likely easier uh, with get date and probably everybody will, will understand it. So that was for me learning like the, the basics. We have like what a method is, we know what a property is. We know what an instantiation is. We know what a, what an instance is now. That's nice. So what that small information I had at the time, which for me actually seemed huge, I actually, uh, when PowerShell 5 came out, and that's when actually PowerShell, uh, classes were officially released, I actually, um, went through the complete documentation um, through the complete documentation and I read it all and I read books and I read whatever you you can find on that subject and I really wanted to learn but what was a bit sh like shame is that like all the examples I saw like they were always talking about like fruits or animals or trees or you know, something like unreal for me that that was like my world my you know i'm not a website developer i'm not a like a game developer so so i don't i don't create anything that has to do with animals i don't work in a in a pet factory or whatever and so for me the, it it was nice but it was too abstract and I needed like something more concrete, something more practical, something closer to my reality to understand that. So at the time, actually, I, uh, I also had like an assignment where I needed to, to create uh, like new, uh, a way of creating new computer, uh, computer objects in Active Directory. So I was doing that. And at the same time, I was writing an article on my blog on PowerShell district, which I called, I don't always use PowerShell classes, but when I do, I do it with class. It's actually not the title of the, of the article, but it's uh, it was the meme. So you most, you probably already, you maybe saw this, this image, uh, but the, the title was a practical use case for PowerShell classes because I really needed something concrete, close to my world and animals, fruits, extra, it was absolutely not plausible for me. So I needed something real. And so I wrote this article. It's three parts. I've linked them here. Um, and I went really, really in detail in there. So for ones that don't have a blog, if you like learning, I would recommend you guys to start a blog because most of the things I've learned, I've learned them and trying to explain them on my blog because I didn't know him when I started to, to write the the article and so this is like a whole learning process there and so that actually really really helped to to get the idea straight and when you try to explain some stuff you you quickly can see when when there's like one small point that you don't completely understand if you cannot explain it 
So each time I didn't know it, or I, when I could not explain it, I went back and I uh, studied it again. So So at this part, we're going to do a, a short demo. I'm going to go through basically uh, not the exact same class I wrote uh, regarding the class computer that I wrote in my article, but like a simplified version of it. So uh, it will be some live coding, recorded live coding. Um, but hopefully you guys can have the like a, a feel of it. We will go through uh, like the basic uh, things we talked before. So what is an, an instance? We create an instance. We will look at properties, how we define them. Uh, we will create methods. And we also talk about something new called constructors. And uh, we also define some other uh, vocabulary. So let's get to it. Hey, so we're back in Visual Studio Code, and we are going to write our first class computer. So basically, this is what I did. Um, I really didn't want to go into that fruit uh, kind of thing. It was actually nice to to get started, but it like it really like it didn't click, right? I needed something more concrete, and I think that that's probably also what is uh, what's holding back like uh, a lot of uh, a lot of us. In, in this thing, this is maybe the examples available on the internet are, you know, blurry or not applicable to what we see in, in our everyday system engineer life. So to write a class, we use the, the keyword class and we follow it by how we want to call the class or here computer brackets, just like for a function. We don't use the get verb, uh, the, the verb noun, um, naming convention normally uh, this is completely fine like this so when we define our class uh, our computer we need to think about what uh, what is actually a computer what of what is it composed right so the computers i needed to create they, they all had like a name right and a description and that's it. That's more than enough. And so actually, if I run this like this, and we want to create what we call a new instance, we do like this. That's the, that's the syntax to create a new instance. And we have name and description like this. We can also use new object type name type name computer and we have the same result so give give i could say so this is the instantiation instantiation Two different ways, same result. So I need to create a, a computer object, and actually, I added way more properties. I added a something like owner and groups, et cetera, et cetera. But for, for the moment, like for our example here, we're gonna keep this simple. We're gonna leave it like this. How do we, how do we set those things? So there's like several ways to do it. I prefer to work with the computer new, like this format. You can go ahead and, and use the new object if you want. So I'm gonna say the computer one variable here is like this. And remember, we can access the properties, the properties of that computer by doing dot notation. See, I did here dot, 
Then we see we have the description and the name. So the name will be, uh, let's call it uh, server 01 and computer one dot description the server for psconf au. Of course, we should not forget the equal sign. And if I run this again, I select press F8 and then actually show what we have in the variable. We actually see that it failed the property server and the description. This is pretty basic stuff, right? So we've worked with properties properties now let's have a look at methods so remember a method is a way to do things it will execute stuff it will calculate something we can um, we can add or you know calculate something but to, to keep things simple here we can we can think about reboots and we can simply say that, now let's leave it like this, reboots, and we're gonna do, we want to add, we want to count the number of reboot. So we're simply gonna do like this, and then reboots, plus, plus. Sorry, this, the reboot, plus, plus. And I will come back to this like in a second. First, I'm hiding this so you don't get confused. First, I want to say something. PowerShell is a beautiful language. It's dynamic. So basically, you don't need to, to say in advance what you want to have or not as types. So name and description, we all agree this is, this is going to be a string. And uh, PowerShell is smart enough actually to convert it to the, the right type, right? But in other languages, if you don't specify the type in front of your um, property, or in front of your field here, so variable, name in this instance, in this example, it would throw an error on compilation. So basically, to be accurate, we should do things like this. This is a string. This is a string. And reboots, this is not going to be a string. What do you think it's going to be? Exactly, an integer. Good. It's good you're following. So, this is also very important to have this here uh, for a very simple reason called trust. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, we have the add reboot method. And in this one, we call this dot reboots plus plus so what does this do like this is actually a keyword and like this threw me off at the very beginning because i couldn't understand the concept this so the keyword points to the current instance of that computer right and i'll show you by the an example that how this this is how this is going to change what you need to keep in mind is that a computer instance here will come with with data attached to it. So data is actually the properties, right? And that data can vary according to which computer you are creating. So reboots. No, what is it? What was it? Add add reboot. At reboot. I'm going to do, of course, I need to define the class, the new class, and then we're going to look into computer one, and we see we have reboot one. And so now, if I call this like several times, can see we have three 
So now, let's do the same thing. This keyword. Let's do the same thing, but for computer two. And basically this one is going to be server number two. Uh, this is going to be another server for psconf eu i'm going to do some copy pasting here tuck like that and this one i'm only calling the reboot once pressing f5 and look we have server 2 another server and reboot has only one so now I can go and call it one more time on this one on computer two. And it only changed the instance of server two. If you go and look in what has computer one, computer one has still three reboots. You can see server two had two reboots, server one, three. So the keyword this will point, when you do the add reboot, it will point to this variable reboots inside of this instance. So here inside of computer two or here inside of computer one. There's one more thing I want to, to show you guys. Actually two more, two more things. I want to talk about constructors. What are they? What do they do? Why do we use them? And I want to cover some vocabulary again, vocabulary, and that is, I want to talk about void, and I want to talk about overloads or overloading. So let's go, let's go with the void. In this add reboot function here, we have again like the, the PowerShell friendliness. Um, a lot of complexity here is uh, abstracted by, by the PowerShell language and it makes like the, uh, some of the, the things more straightforward here to, to start. We can see at the beginning, do you remember we, I didn't use like the, those, I didn't define the type of my variables here. In another language it would fail. Here as well, actually a method, when you declare a method, in most of the programming languages I know of, when you declare them, you declare a method, you should say what this method returns. So if I add now um, another method called get reboot, get reboot count, let's say, like this. And I simply want to return the reboot count, this dot reboot. And here I'm going to specify the type of reboots. And this is an int. So basically the compiler, the programming language, or the other programmer knows that when he, ca when he calls this get reboot count, he's going to return an int and not a float or not a date time, for example, or not a string. So if we call this one here again, now we can see we have this uh, get. I need to define my class here again, once again. Um, it is loaded, and then here get. You can see get reboot count. Indeed. When you redefine it, you need to rerun it at least once. F8 is not really working on my computer. Seems like it. Oh, see, it is. I had one here I didn't notice. And so that's basically the, the amount of reboot. So now if I launch this one several times and I do get reboot count, I get uh, uh, the count four. I've launched it four times. So we know what the type is that we will get back. 
we can also see it um, over here computer and get member a computer one of course we can see get reboot count we can see here at the beginning we have int and notice here add reboot it says void so what is that now that we know that the method actually needs to return uh, something it actually does a calculation and returns something of a specific type but what happens when it actually does not return anything so in this case we return like an integer the amount of reboot but in this case we are simply increasing this number containing reboots right and we're not returning anything so what is this actually of return type it is void so void in english so i'm speaking in english here so void means nothing right and so in other languages uh, like maybe it's it's not that straightforward. Void, like in French, is is c'est rien. It's nothing. Huh? L'espace, le vide intersidéral, for example, or like in German, it's leer, um, or nix. <laughs> and um, yeah, void means actually nothing. And so you need to define this in front of your methods that don't have uh, that does that don't return anything. So you saw at the beginning that I didn't use it. I simply didn't put it there to keep things simple for you guys and to allow everybody to follow up, but it's really not recommended to not adding them uh, simply because it makes everything way more easier to understand when, when, when it's written there. You know it doesn't return anything, boom, fertig. So we talked about void, I'm going to talk about overloads now. Let's say again, our add reboots here. We, we have this one server, like each time it reboots, it doesn't reboot only once, it reboots a number of times because like it's doing some updates, installing some things, rebooting several times. So we want to have actually possibility to, to have a parameter here where we're gonna say, add reboot and then have a number like five, for example. So we are going to simply copy this method and then we are going to do, we specify like the type. So, or let's say reboot. Now let's say times, like it better. So reboot plus equal and then times. So now we're gonna have the possibility to use add reboot. So either just once without any parameter and it will, as we've seen up until now, just simply add one reboot to that reboot variable or we create, uh, we give it a parameter, sorry, of the amount of reboot so this example is maybe a little bit silly but like it's the so that you guys get the, the gist of it um so i'm saving i am redefining my class you can see like i'm reloading it in in this console and i create the instance of my uh, computer one here and then computer one dot add reboot reboot and in here i want to add five reboots on oh, let's say 10 this is like a server it's really not working well and so now i call the get reboot count and we see we have 10. it returns 10. and i call this one once now this one again and we see now it's 11. so what do we do here actually so in the end, we have twice the same method, but the same name, one has no parameter, so empty parentheses, and the other one has just one parameter, times, which is an integer, which we add here. So what we did here is we created something called an overload. We are overloading a method with a new method. 
And we distinguish those two methods by something called a signature, which is this. The parameters here define a signature. So, Achtung! So you can create as many like overloads if you that you want. Like I can say also now, I don't know, string, you know, name, and when I reboot, I can I could potentially also do this dot name equal dot name. But this is this is really not a good idea because we add a reboot and we change the name at the same time. It's a really bad idea. But what I want to show here is that like the signature here is different than this one and then this one. So the language is smart enough to differentiate these ones. But Achtung, like now we have, we want to define, you know, add 100 reboots, let's say, right? And we want to do it like this. This won't work. Why? Because this is the same signature. 100 reboots and this is not allowed because this is the same signature as over here so be sure that you only have um, signatures that are are different use the keyword void last thing i want to show you guys is a constructor so up until now we have always used Compute a new. And then we simply call properties. We set properties like this and we call directly methods like this. But, you know, I actually, like a computer in, in my world doesn't didn't exist without a name and without a description. It was impossible for that computer to exist without a name and a description. So you can actually control what, what the instantiation so the creation of that computer will look like and that's by using the, the constructor so although it's not defined here i'm gonna add like this methods methods up here we have properties right although it's not defined here we have something here called constructors and it helps you to construct your your object to instantiate your object and so for that how does it work you simply it's just like a regular method but it should have it must have the exact same name as the class and that's it you and so for this one you don't need to explicitly say the return value because as you guys saw each time you create an instance of computer, creating one, it sends information back. But what does it do? It actually sends an instance, computer one, it sends an instance of type computer. So basically here, what you, what we could say is that it looks kind of like this returns an object back of type computer but here you can see we immediately have like a, an error saying that we the constructor cannot specify a return type but in the end this is this is what it what it actually is so now we have a constructor and so we have one it's the parameterless it's basically calling this one and so now we can either like leave that one and we want to create a new one so let's do that and we want to allow we want to be able people to create to give the name a name so let's say computer name and we want them also to pass the description which is of a type string so description and now we do this dot computer is equal to computer name and this dot description is equal to this description from here so that's it so in this particular case if i redefine the 
script now. So we can call it like this, as we did up until now. Or we can actually create computer three. Computer three is equal to server zero three and again another another and another server. All right. I should have called my variable server. This is a, yeah. Okay, it's confusing a little bit for me. I'm pressing F8, and we see. We see, cannot find overload, see, overload that word, right? For new and the argument count too. So let's have a look at it. We have our first constructor, one and an overloaded constructor, which two, with two parameters. So this probably simply means that I didn't load it in, in, in memory. So I do F8, like on, on my Mac, like F8 doesn't seem to work all the time. And I'm calling the same line here so this dot computer doesn't exist of course not it's dot name silly me up uh, this dot name absolutely makes sense thank you for telling me i'm silly and i'm calling redefining the the class calling computer three and we see like server three oh so we have an overload for the constructor and we managed to pass like the name and the description at the same time. So we covered constructors, void and overloads. Cool. So if we sum up this up until now, um, we've actually learned and understood what a, what a property actually is. We've learned what a method is. We know that the method should have a return type property should be declared with their type in front. But uh, PowerShell uh, allows us to, to have this flexibility to not put them in advance, uh, in front, sorry. Um, we've talked about constructors, overloads of uh, constructors. Um, we know that we don't need to add the return type of a constructor, but it is implicitly the type of the class. So in our example, it was computer. Uh, we explained the definition of what an instance is. We have explained the definition of an overload. We've talked about the keyword this, uh, this sorry, which uh, points to the, like data located in the current instance of that class, so computer one or computer two. So the reboots, reboots of computer one or the reboots of computer two. And uh, we've explained the key. On this part, we are actually going to talk about the different modules and the learning process, process related to, to me, so on, on my personal experience. And we're going to see like the maybe some of the common mistakes we can see and some false good practices around that. Um, are, we, are we actually been trying things out all the way? And we can see I've made some mistakes, which I have corrected through time, and maybe some not. Um, like I'm gonna talk quickly about the like some like a series I wrote on classes, will help me to to deepen my my knowledge. Um, I'm gonna show you like some tools I've built to actually help me in this learning process, and yeah, like how I came to the to this best structure of of a module which for me is the hybrid structure uh, module, hybrid module structure, sorry. So jumping in the cold water. So I created this, this, this project called Ma um, hosts file management, which was a PowerShell module to, to, to manage uh, host files. And I wrote an article on it and it's really, really, really detailed. And I would recommend you, you read it if you have a, some time for it. It is 
uh, very detailed on the thought process behind creating a project, so a module project and um, using classes. So this version of this article has been written before uh, we introduced actually functions on it. So it's it's only talking about the the class structure. So maybe maybe I should expand it. Um, most likely I should, but um, I don't think I would do it. Um, but if there's some uh, popular interest, I, I, I might consider it. And so, let's go back to PowerPoint. So that, that, um, that module here, I uh, made some mistakes, but I've corrected uh, like a few of them. And I had also like some, uh, some nice contributions there. Thank you again to the community. Uh, to the French community, actually, the French people have been really deeply involved in this one, and uh, like the one big one big problem here that I that I see on this one, which I actually see a little bit like everywhere still, is like dot sourcing. We can see here, like in this PSM one, the what we're doing is we're dot sourcing everything. We're dot sourcing enums, we're dot sourcing classes, we are dot sourcing. Um, private functions and that sourcing functions, right? Public functions. That that is really bad for two reasons. One, this is it doesn't scale well. So if you have like a lot of functions in and so a lot of files in these folders, your module will take like really a long time to load. And two, this is also a security risk. You can exchange any of these files with like if you're a hacker with you know something else and it will automatically be loaded in your script so if your script is scheduled with i don't know like a super admin account or so and it imports this module where it has like a security vulnerability then you're doomed so error number one error number two so jumping in cold water you actually realize that the water is actually quite cold so i wrote this other module probably before the host file management now that i think about it and this was really this is really like for the french community and this this um this association which um helps actually in providing uh, data of everything what what is happening in uh, in our republic in with with the, for the political side of it is actually um, available on a specific API. So basically, I, I wrote a PowerShell module which helps to to retrieve that information. So I actually um, this class is over here. So this is the English version of the article. I also have like a French version of the article, and this actually helps to to get more insights on what's happening on on. Um, like on, on those benches there, on those red benches. So it's it was interesting for me. But so technically, let me, let me go to the, so it's called Regard Citoyen PS. And so I saw quite a few issues with this one and the first one is in the PSD one. We can see here scripts to process. So remember, I was saying that my in my learning process, my objective at a moment was so I I saw all the negative aspects of using classes. So there's no common based help for the end users. Um, you cannot use uh, you cannot call the using so module anywhere in your script it needs to be at the very very top and that's, that's really constrained uh, and actually if you if you um, do not use using modules your classes don't get loaded right so it was that was a problem for me so i was basically looking into alternatives and one of the thing i saw was scripts to process I was like yeah nice why not i'm going to use that and so we can see here this load module in scripts process load classes dot ps1 what is it doing so it's located in classes in dot classes loading in dot classes the only thing that's doing here it is using module boom this is is really not good it worked and I've left it like this because it it works but or maybe it's not not good 
but there's way better to do than this. And since we're here, we can also look at this here. We can see again dot sourcing, dot sourcing classes, dot sourcing private functions, dot sourcing public functions. This is actually not a good idea for the reasons I already told you. And this is okay, S same mistake, but I did it twice. Then I actually wrote this series about classes and Actually, for, for people that do not blog, I'm not sure uh, people understand the benefit of it. So, yes, you're sharing your knowledge, and no, uh, you know, people won't see your knowledge. Some people actually think that. Uh, but, like, the, the thought process you put into the effort of trying to explain some, some technical thing helps you to go really deep in that process and to understand it completely, simply Sometimes just to finalize in one sentence, you realize, oh, there's like a, there's like one bit I'm not sure 100% of it. And so you go and look it up. And that's really like a, a thought process, a learning process while you, 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 you write this, this article, an investigation kind of. And so when I click on here, we have um, this, this article and it's, it's basically a big introduction on classes. So if you don't know, anything about classes this talk you're watching the right video right i've already gave give you like a lot of links but this one is is a gold gold one i think where we really have like in six steps in six articles here you get from zero to hero actually with with classes and so i'm covering so introduction properties method constructors inheritance and polymorphism and basically the um, the, the two, the, the first four articles are actually on uh, sysops, four sysops, I think it's called. And the last two on the more, let's say, complicated or advanced are, so inheritance and polymorphism are on, on my blog on PowerShell District. And so here I, again, really try to explain things visually because that's, that's how I understand things. And... I always use the same example. Sorry, I'm searching for the links so I can open the, the article on forces apps. So look, that's me. Hello. And we can see the very basic. What is an object, new object, blah, blah, blah. So here I really learned even more. So not for the, like the first four things, but for the last thing. So I really learned a lot by doing this uh, this article. So just for um, for the sake of having the the links, I've put them on the on the PowerPoint, so everybody can can go and maybe go through every one of this article of this blog post. That would really uh, help. And then arrived. Uh, the maturity, I would say, I've been working on using classes in different projects. So those two projects we saw are the only two that are open source, right? And then I, of course, project at work, which are, where I also use classes, and I've never, uh, never demoed that code, uh, simply because it's it's closed source, right? It's it's for work purposes. So PSHTML was really like the the. the cornerstone where I went from trying things out up until uh, finding actually what I what I what I was looking for like the best structure and uh, we can have a look at the, at the code and and first we can look in the pshtml folder in the psm1 we can see it's a big file and we have no dot sourcing. Everything is in there. So I've learned in the process. Oh, sorry for that. I've learned in the process that we should stop dot sourcing. I've I've learned it the hard way because my in in this one I have like really like tons 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 of um, of lines of code and sorry and 
yeah, maybe not tons, but I think I have 2,000 or so, and th that's like really a lot of functions. I feel like it's really slow actually just to scroll. Um, so I decided to, I had to actually put everything in a, in one piece and one file, I got rid of, uh, of that sourcing. I also got uh, rid of, the, of course, of the scripts to process. I uh, didn't need that anymore because uh, basically what I was doing, I was using a build script, which would actually go and take all those things I had in classes. So I have like one actually family of classes in a file here. And I have a build script that would go and sum everything up in one and unique uh, PSM1 file. And actually I discussed that exact process in um, in my blog article, which I give you the link in a, in a few seconds. And then, so I was talking about tools I've built during the, during my learning process. So uh, I was doing PSHTML and, and PS class utils at the same time. So basically uh, when I try to understand the, like the structure of PSHTML, for example, or actually from, from other, from other modules as well, I realized that, that reading through the code can be difficult. And I, in my learning process, I, I, I learned that, um, something called uh, UML existed and uh, it's actually um, a visual representation of your classes. And so here uh, we can see on the right, we have a UML-ish diagram. And um, basically I wrote a tool, which one of its capabilities is to take your PowerShell class code and create a diagram like this with it. And so we can see we have class whoop and it, like WAP inherits from WOOP and WAP inherits from WOOP as well, and it generates a diagram like that. Very handy. So if you use classes, you have this free functionality with it. If you go and download PS Class Utils, of course, it's an open source project, completely free. The other thing that it also does, it can create automatically pass the test for you, right? So because we can trust classes, which is really fundamental, and uh, com compared to functions, you never really know what you're going to get back, what we don't define the return type and these type of things. So if we have a look at, at this one here, you can see, so this is for, um, I'm going to call, see, we, I have this class, CU interface author, and three methods and I call the the function here and see right see you pass the test over here and we see it generated like the describe block the it block it added like a dot source uh, of the file and it created all the um, all the tests and this actually generates the amount of tests for every function, for every property, and it creates, if you run it, a code coverage of 100%, which is phenomenal, right? Tests will have, will need to be tweaked because the script cannot really analyze everything. Like for example, if you need an Active Directory object, you need to either give a mocked one or, or, or give, you know, a real Active Directory object if, uh, if you're in integration testing or so, but it will help you with that. And so that, that's really, that was my personal objective actually, because for example, actually at work, I had a, I had a huge module I wrote and I was not really doing TDD actually at the time. And then in the end, I had like 2000 lines of classes for which I need to, to create past the test. So that's what I did. I used that. And so, uh, Finally, I arrived on, on this, uh, this structure um, in PSHTML and also applied it to um, PS class details and also backported it to, um, to hosts file management. Uh, this is something I have called the hybrid module or hybrid structure mod module simply because uh, before I was always choosing between either using functions 
or using classes. And then at the very beginning, I only used function, then I've learned classes, then I only wanted to use classes, but I realized that the, that the world is only perfect with, with the two of them. And so I tried really hard to find a way to, um, to make it work, to make the mechanism work in a way that it's user-friendly, but also developer-friendly. So uh, the hybrid structure module, uh, for the hybrid structure is for me the, the best solution for this. Um, basically, um, and I'll talk about, I will talk more about that a little bit uh, later when we convert uh, the, um, the script to uh, an existing script to a class. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is to have public functions, which will, or let's go from left to the right. It is to have a class in which we're going to add uh, functionality, so data via properties and functionality via methods. And we're going to expose those methods, for this functionality, to our end users, which are actually represented here in this script part, via public functions and because functions inside of a module a public function actually has access to a private class its methods and everything so this is how we do it you use the class as an api structure and call um, your methods via functions and that's it that really change everything um, this also a bigger abstraction on, on the complexity of the functions. And uh, you can, for example, segregate this uh, or separate the work in, in two parts. One developer that can work only on the API side of things, for example, and another one that does kind of like the, the front end part of things. So the functions and um, that's it. So maybe uh, a very experienced developer on the API side, so on the classes part, and uh, maybe like a more junior, on the, um, the front end side of things, so the functions. So I've written actually an extensive article um, on this. Um, it's available on my other blog. I would really recommend to read this. I explained the whole concept of it. Um, and I actually, I actually explain here what's the difference between a class and a function, the advantages, disadvantages. We I have like a table that summarizes everything. So I would recommend that you guys uh, have a read on this. So simply click on the image and you will get to the to the good part. So that's basically the the learning process I had personally. So um, you guys see I've ha made a lot of mistake mistakes and. Up until a certain point in time, I always saw that as mistakes, and I was like, "Ah, oh, man, why did I do it like that?" But in the end, it's it's just a they were actually attempts of trying to to build the best solution, and in the end, that reflects actually my learning process. So those failures are actually not failures because actually code worked, but never really, you know, 100% user friendly, or maybe some functionality was missing, like get help uh, or things like that. Um, we can also see that in this whole learning process, in, in this whole trying to, to get to learn how to work with classes, I've created tools, I've created open source projects I've been in contact with, like developers I've never had before, simply to, to, to learn more and yeah, develop the tools I actually needed to understand it. And in the end, I never gave up. I had an idea. I knew where I wanted to go. I knew the functionality I wanted to have from a specific moment in time. And then I actually tried things out up until I got there. And then in the end, I think I actually found the best solution, which is um, the hybrid structure module. And that's the one I'm trying to yeah, push as a standard is maybe a strong word. Uh, but that together with... Um, with um, with with a build script is is really the the way I currently uh, promote internally at work and like in open source project etc. And more and more people I see uh, start to use that. So and now we are going to dive in probably the most interesting part of this video. Uh, converting a partial script to a class. File.ps1, 
uh, for sake of a better name. And let's think of, you know, what we need to do when we want to write a class. There's several small things we would like to do. And a class actually has data and it has function functionality, right? And so data are the properties, functionality are the methods. And we need to define uh, these two things uh, uh, kind of like ahead of time if we want to have a class that is actually um, easy to use. So my objective here is to convert an existing script of mine. Uh, if you go on PowerShell District, which is my blog, tips and tricks here, we have something called uh, how to create random files with PowerShell. This is a very, very, very old uh, article. Actually, if you look at the date, this is August 8, 2012. And actually, this is my very, 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 very first blog post on this on this blog. And I actually rewrote it some, some time back. And you can see I actually put it on a GitHub gist. And uh, this, this function, uh, it was used to create uh, random files. And uh, so let's copy it over to the computer locally, control C, and let's have it here. So create files.ps1, and let's put it in here. So we can close all of this, create random files. create random files. So there we have it. I actually wrote this function so eight years back because we were doing a, a Windows XP, Windows 7 migration, and we actually needed to simulate. Um, uh, we also actually started migrating the user profiles. So images, uh, so things in, in C, username, you know, images in, and in my documents and in several other uh, places. And we needed to simulate the like data. Uh, we needed to pretend that some users have almost no data. And of course, some users have like a lot of data. And also like a, addition to that, some file types were actually excluded. They were not allowed to be on those um, profiles and they were supposed to be local. Things like MPEGs, so MP4s and, and JPEGs and all these things, these were not allowed to be uh, on in the images. They were supposed to be uh, local. So we also had to add some additional um, functionality in that regard, so uh, the, the client were was happy. So if we have a look at this function, we have the first thing is we have a good common paste help. And we can go ahead and actually have a look at the examples. So we, we can see we have parameter total size, number of files, file types. And basically, we have here these examples. So total size, we want to create a total size of 50 megabytes, number of files of 13, and in this place. And it would go and it would create, you know, 15 divided by uh, 50 divided by 13. Um, it would create 13 files of a size of 50 divided by 13, for example, in that location. So, or and here we have an ex another example with five gigabytes, oh, three files here, so like uh, one dot something. So this, this is what we have. And basically, this is what we want to, this is my exercise to, to modify it. So like in a class, so let's, let's think of the functionality. So how it worked today, it was like this. I'm going to simply copy over this example. So how should it work? 
So this is what we have today. And frankly, this is already problematic because inside here we have a function and I'm calling it as a script. So this is basically not going to work that well. Um, of course, I was, um, I didn't have like the same experience as today. Um, so let's also take this opportunity to, to write this uh, in, in a better way. So I want, how would like this to work? I know I want to generate. So my objective is to create fake files of various sizes. I also want to use this for scenarios where, for example, you want to test uh, alarming. Uh, you want to see if when your C drive, for example, is full, if you get an alarm, you know, from SCUM or Isinga or whatever for tool, uh, you maybe want to test this to do some backups. You need to simulate like a lot of, of data. And also for migrations, for example, you want to see, or for CODAS, for example, you want to be sure that, you know, at a certain amount of size of files or amount of files, you want to send out a message. So this function, um, this class actually would actually do that functionality for us. So create fake files, create different sizes and like it must have kind of real names and that's that's basically why i wrote the the other function is that because uh we were presenting this solution to clients um i didn't want to have you know like a file called dot tmp it, like it looked it looked not good to me and yeah i wanted to have you know at least like a some some understandable word and file extension that actually mattered. Um, so docx, jpeg, pdf, extra. So kind of real names, kind of real names. So how technically, technically, how is, how is this going to work? So a class we would create like this so fake file new for example like this we want to create this and this is my file but actually fake file we're not going to create just one file right so fake file creator is that a good name no not really so random file, fake file generator, fake file generator. Yeah, let's, let's do that. So generator, let's call it like this, fake file generator. So once I have that, I want to be able to say, where do we want to locate it? So in which, which folder path, where in C, temp or like in D my files or whatever. So I want to set the folder path. So set folder path. I also want to have basically like the size generator dot set size. And actually, I don't want to set the size of one file. I simply want to specify a location, so C temp, and I want to say, I want to generate for five gigabytes of data. Go ahead. So set total size. That's what I want to do. And maybe I want to say also the amount of files. I want to have because do I want to have one file of one file of one gigabyte or five gigabytes? Sorry, 
So maybe this is sometimes I want to have, yes. Or maybe sometimes I want to have lots of lots of lots of lots of lots of lots of small files of like a few KBs, you know, to simulate a, a huge for each loop on copying files or and see how that would work in a script, for example. So set we want to set the number of files. So set number of files. Then when we, once we have that, we simply want to go and create it because here we are, we've only set like the, so the properties, like the information we actually need to create something. And then here, now we want to create it, we want to have the possibility to create it. So ge generator.create. Okay, this looks pretty good, I think. So the data, data is basically to answer those question here. The data would be the folder path. It would be like the total size, total size. It would be total file, uh, number of files, total file count. Total file count, let's do it like this. Now, number of files is better. Number of files. And that's it. That's what we want. And so the functionality here, what we need to, to do is we need to, one, generate a real or generate a meaningful name, meaning file name, and create the data based on the meaning for file name. So that's what we want to do. Okay, so now that we have this, we kind of know how we want this to work. We can see actually, so these are actually methods of how we would set these things. So we can actually go ahead and already start writing our fake file generator class. Of course, I need to write class correctly. And we already know that since the create is only here, when we call this create, these three things, these three values must be stored somewhere. So that's data. So it's basically the data here, we said here. So let's copy these ones and put them here. So this is a variable, this is not a variable, and this is not a variable. And we know actually folder path is a folder path. And so we don't want this to be to be possible that this would contain something else than a like a folder. You know, and often uh, according to a type of the function you use, sometimes it could return a file and uh, PowerShell has the uh, capability to convert it automatically to a folder path. And it could, we could have like some errors here. So we want to simply enforce this type here to system.io.directory uh, info, of course. Directory, uh, not spotlight, directory. IntelliSense on a Mac is not the same as what I'm used to. So directory info. Total size, this is straightforward. This is an integer and number of files is also going to be an integer. Uh, 
and that's it. And so we could actually start with this, which is actually what we're going to do. Just one additional method here is to create, and let's leave it like this. So for the moment, we we have not even looked into the the functionality of our function. We just went into the common based help, and we took out what we have here. We've thought about our our the old needs. So why did we wrote that function in the first place? What is our new objective, or uh, uh, you know what what is our new need? our new business need and we based on that we have created so the objectives we've defined the data that that class needs to have and the functionality so the second thing also needs to do it it needs to generate a meaningful name and so i'm just going to add this here somehow somehow somewhere it needs to do that it needs to create a file with a meaningful name in this folder path So I think now it's a good time to go back in the script and see if we can go and steal some of the existing code. Uh, because today we have, for now we have actually, I think, created what we could without uh, using the, that code. So let's go have a look. We So we need to, Let's have a look at the code, right? First, because in this beginning block, we have look, we have something called create file name. That's perfect. That's actually what we needed, right? So we needed some functionality that go and created a file. And so what it's doing, if you have a look at it, we have like a like a long list, so an array of extensions. So one of multimedia, one office extension. We add them here together, and then basically there's like a parameter called file types. And based on that parameter, we select either one extension, so of multimedia, office, or of all of them. And afterwards, we simply use the get verb commandlet to get two words out of it. And we add that to an extension, and that's it. We return that. So let's go back in our fake file here and see what we can copy. And I actually think that this line is perfect. This is what we want to have. Of course, now we are not going to create this like a big array like this. And we for this, this really smells like an enum. It makes sense actually to me to put those things that work together um, or that are same family, let's say, in, a, in an enum type of a construct. So we will do that later. Uh, but for now, we can go and go ahead and, and try to implement something to create that meaningful name. So uh, get, get file name. Let's do it like this. And so in here, I copy paste this, this section here. And that's one thing. I don't really like this that much. Um, so basically what's happening up until here, I have verb. And so it just simply take two random values of the get verb command. So for the people that don't know get verb, it's actually the list of supported verbs on, on PowerShell. And so get verb, um, select verb. Yeah, I clicked something there. And we can see here we have a long list. And so basically what we're doing is we're just taking two, sticking them together, and we have our name. Very easy, and it's all out of the box. So. Let's do this here. We have random two and 
I want to avoid to have this for each loop in here and simply I'm going to add it in a in an array. I'm just selecting the verb because remember we have this it's in a in the verb um, property. All right. Just closing this one here. And we want to join on space. And we want to return this. And of course, get found MC here, it's complaining. Invalid return statement between void method. So remember I said if you don't specify anything, PowerShell is smart enough to estimate that it it will return a void. So actually nothing. So here it detected hey, you're actually not returning nothing, and basically we want to return a string here. So just add the string here and that's it. So I actually think we can go and test this. So this get file name should be working. And if I define my class and I do, I create an instance, so I press F8. And now if I do generator dot get file name, I have expand resize. Turn something, but it's actually not exactly exactly what we want to have. So let's just add a breakpoint here and see what it's doing. And so it's this join here, which is wrong. Actually, you know what I should do? I should probably remove the space then. Let's have a look. Yeah, that's what I need to do. That's what I'm going to do. F5. Let's go back to here. And I'm going to remove this breakpoint. I need to redefine my class. I'm going to call this chunk. You see here, we have revoke close. Perfect. So, so that's done. We basically went to the essential and we just have here a file name. So the file name is just not a file name. It's also like a path, but also an extension, right? And so the file name should have an extension. So that extension, get extension, should be like this. I think here it should return something like return JPEG, for example. Or that JPEG. And so, Let's do it like this. So there's two ways. So either we have get file name and we put everything in here, or maybe we we separate that in another function. So actually the file name. Yeah, the file name and name when we look at the at the file info properties, the name would be with the extension and the base name would be without the extension. So we're going to leave it like the file name and we simply going to add. So F F name it's like this, and then we're going to, to do to return on this one. So F name plus this dot get extension and this should actually return like the name plus dot jpeg so if i no launch this again now we can see we have new clear dot jpeg if i call it again 
import pop. <laughs> it's funny, import pop.jpg, or let's call this several times. Read disconnect, switch build, out unpublish, resize, ping, read write, blah, blah, blah. So you guys get the gist. So I'm happy with this. Uh, one thing that is missing is, you know, this, the uh, enums that we had, right? Fine, enums, the, the list of things. And so for me, these are, are actually going to be enums. So I prepared them already uh, in advanced here. And I simply want to go and fetch them. So don't look at this code. Don't go look at this code. And here, basically, I'm just going to add the enums, copying them in here. So I have two, two enums, the office extensions and the media extensions. So the media extensions are a little bit uh, smaller than in the original example, but this will suffice just for this exercise. So we have this here, we have our enums, and the enums are just here for the extensions, right? So that's, uh, not sure why I was working like this, didn't even notice it. The enums are here just for the, for the extension, as I said. So we have our get extension here. And so we want to go ahead and return just one extension, right? So we have, it's possible if you work with enum, you, you get, can do the get names here and we can do get random. And here we need to give the name of the, of the enum office files that office files, office extension, sorry. And this should work. This should be sufficient for our case. But yeah, docx, good. And let's call it again, XLS, nice. And doc, awesome. So we simply want to return this And to return the plot, uh, dot plus this. And that's it. And so in the get extension, ah, in the file name we already have, we already added the, the method, awesome. And so now we should be able to call our thing as defined over here. And the list of extensions way to make. We have them all. So let's have a look at this. Yeah. Okay, we need to do like this. Let's go this again. Yeah. Convert show PDF. Yay. Let's do another one. Resolve, protect resolve.pdf. Register restart, XLS, enable resolve, find unprotect backup convert to. So yeah, so those random file names are maybe, uh, the names are maybe silly, but they, they will always be better than like this, this gibberish that we can have, you know, like if create like really random using random on, on just the alphabet, for example. And I preferred this, so also it, it can add like some, like a touch, a funny touch maybe. And also the extensions are, are more real, more uh, palpable. So let's, let's sum up. What, what do we have up until now? We, and so what do we want it to have? 
we wanted to have set folder path, set total size, and set number of files. And we have none of these ones. So let's let's create that. It's pretty straightforward because actually we have almost done like the the most complicated part, let's say, because so we want to let's avoid we won't return anything, we're just gonna set something. So set folder path. So actually, before I do this, I'm just gonna copy this. Just want to show you guys. So if we do that, we create an instance here and we call it, we have our our file here. But if we just look at, you know, dollar generator, we see here we have those properties, right? And so if we do, for example, this generator dot folder path equal, um, it's going to work. And we look at generator, we have dot slash or so. Um, I don't know, you know what, like files. Yeah, let's create a folder here. Actually, good thing, files. So we can actually just put it here at the root. So we have, we're in file PS1. We have a folder called files. And so I actually even think you can do copy path. Yep, that's where it is located on my laptop. And if I do F8 and I look at what generator has, we can see we have the folder path like this. And so we can do the same thing for total size, number of files, but it, there's actually principle uh, that says that we should avoid to give uh, the users the possibility to, um, to write directly property settings. But like on PowerShell, we're more flexible than in other languages. Um, I also like to so add getters and setters just for the for a better comprehension for people that for people that are discovering our class or actually via an instance. So let's let's implement this this folder here. Very very basic, very easy. So it needs to be of course of this type so it returns void set folder path and I paste this in there and this dot for the path is equal to a folder path and so basically this is exactly the same line as over here but in this particular case, I'm targeting that current instance of this, right? So I could potentially call my class twice and have a different value for folder path using this, this way here. So we have set folder paths. We want to have set total size and number of files. So it's exactly going to be the same thing. Void set total size is going to be an int total size and set number of size number of files sorry This dot number of files is equal to number of files. So this is pretty straightforward, and I'm not even going to to, to write a test for this. This is a uh, this makes sense. And so 
this commentary, I can remove it. We already have that. And so we have a, a way to set those things and Now it's it's maybe time to look into this create thing. And that's the, left it at the end because that was the a little bit like the difficult part because in this older version, sorry, I'm gonna go back here. In this, in the older version of the script, I have used the create. So let's, let's look at the create. How did we do that? We have the create here, it, it used, FSUTO. And so at the time, so eight years ago, PowerShell was not cross platform, right? And so we could expect that this FSUTO.exe was present on a Windows box. And so today, this might not even be the case, right? And Actually, so let's gain some time. And I have that here somewhere already. And I'm gonna just to gain some time. But you saw, I Googled it and we saw we can create a file using new object and then specifying an array of bytes. Then we specify here the size. And using the IO file, write all bytes, specifying the path and here, so this out is actually the, the um, size of bytes. It will create a file in at that location. So this is exactly what we need. So I'm going to remove all of this to make it a little bit more understandable. And so what we have is we have folder path. And so also we have a case we only set it here, but let's say we don't set it. it. We could potentially have like an empty variable. So let's add like a default variable uh, value here. So PS script root. So if you don't specify anything, just create the file at the root. Okay, total size. We want to have one megabyte by default and number of file, let's say five, like as default value in case nobody sets anything. So we want to go and we want to use the and so now this is a, the tricky one. So when we do the create, here we have a single size. And so we don't want to have a single size. So by the way, this is going to be size, but we want to have um, the total size divided by the number of files, right? So single size is equal to this dot. Oh, what's it doing? Is equal to this dot total size divided by this dot number of files. That's what we want to do. And then we simply want to create like this. So we need to create this for more than one file. So for the total amount of number files. Right, so we have here a single size that we want and we need to create this for the amount of files. So let's, let's use like a Node school for loop. So I, so actually let's let's use a snippet. So for I is equal to zero. Yes, it could also work. We want to have number of as long as I is smarter than the number of of fools, number of files, and by the way, this is this does that number of files, just do I minus minus. 
So we're going to count I will be at the very first time here, five, then the, the second time it runs, it's going to be four, and then three, then two, then one, then zero. Nine should be your way around. Well, I is greater than zero. Here, I is equal to this number of files. We want to create, in this loop, the object. So we have, here already we have the size, and we need actually an array all files and that's what we do so here we have file path so we also need to, to get this file path. And so in this create, we need to go ahead and, and create this file path. So file path is equal to, so remember it is, so this is a join path, so join path. And so path, this dot folder path, or so this folder and the child name, child path, should be get this start get file name let let's do it like this file name is equal to this start get file name so things are maybe a little more clearer like this file name so like this it's going to build Like this is going to build the file name over here. Based on this, we're going to create the full path. File full path. And once we have that, we tell him, hey, just create it over here. And we don't need to cast it over here. This will be done down here, and like this, we add it to the array of files, and that's what we want to return. Return all files. So at least we know what we actually created. So system.io dot file info, and it's an array like this. And now we have actually the possibility to create one or more files and let's let's go ahead and try it out. It's probably going to fail. Uh, this is the uh, demo effect, let's say. Um, so we have, we create the thing. So of course this is not going to work like this. We need it to set folder path. So we need to call it using F5, otherwise the PS script root has another value. So set folder size, folder path. I'm just gonna leave it there. And so let's have a look at, at this files folder here. So I need to generator dot create. And 
And so let's leave the default values for now and let's call F5 and I'm gonna stop this immediately. It doesn't contain a method called set folder path. How is it called? What do you mean? It's right there. It's right there, set folder path. Set folder path. So fake file generator does not contain the method name set folder path. So. It actually does. That's uh, that's very strange. Okay, let's let's restart this. Let's call it again. So for some reason, this line doesn't get called. So generator, generator. Okay, there's something wrong up there. So let's have a look at it. So let's add like the default parameter, uh, uh, constructor, fake file generator, fake file generator. Uh -huh. Okay, so it should create this folder path 20, not even 2020. So now we go to the next line. It should create in the files folder here five files of one megabyte. So let's go ahead. It didn't work. Okay, let's troubleshoot. Let's see what's happening. Let's go into the create, go over here and see what's going with the create. So we also notice that oh it it returned there's a return statement here. So somehow I have the feeling I, I maybe missed this up here, the I. The for loop, I don't write for loops like this quite often, so it's probably problem probably resolves resides in here. So just going through things. It's gone back. I like I added the space. So he doesn't remember remember it like this. So we simply want to stop over here at five. F5, and now I'm in the for loop. So let's go in F1. So I didn't even went, went once in there. So wait, how many noob? What did I do wrong? So 
So what's the value of i? i is, is empty, really, i is empty. So this number of files, so what is this number of files is five. Ah, look, number of aisles. Okay, that's why. That is why. Go. Okay, let's let's add a breakpoint here. See if he gets in it. If he gets in it, we should be good. Yes, we in it. Let's see. I. Let's go ahead and do a full tour. So i is 4 now, and if we go and have a look at files, we have one new file called this connect resume dot dot. Okay, nice. So I'm just going to quit this, remove the breakpoint, and remove this breakpoint, and I'm going to let it run. So, and look, here we have it. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 files. We can see that it all has the same length. And if we go into the files folder, we actually have it. And like even VS Code added those nice little icons for us. So, and if we go ahead and so we see the here the, the length. And so we have actually um, solved this. We have actually created. Um, Based on an existing script, we migrated uh, that script to a class. But so, you know, we can ask ourselves, are we happy with this? So I would say yes for the moment. And so we can say set number of files. And I want to add 20. And then I want to do the generator. And I want to create set total size of, I don't know, 50 megabytes. That's what I want to do. So this file name I can I can remove. And so for the sake of this demo, I'm just gonna remove those fake files. I save it and I press F5 and boom, we should have like a bunch of files in here. And so when we look at it, indeed we have like a bunch of files, and so copy path. Um, get child item path and measure and we have 20 and that's that's actually what we said we want 20 of 50 megabytes awesome and so now I simply want to do one of one not megabyte but one gigabyte and remove this all of this here delete Save it, call it, boom, we have one set grant. And if we look, we have it right here. And so if we, just to be sure that's the right amount, so one gigabyte is this size. Uh -huh. So, review and finder, that's one megabyte. So that's wrong. So what do we have, what are we doing wrong? Single size. So we are setting set total size to one gigabyte. Is this correct? So set of 
course, set total size. That's the problem, is equal to total size. So we had this value here set to one megabyte for all the time. So if we call it again. And so now we have suspend split. <laughs> doc and look this is really this is one gigabyte this makes more sense it's like the wheel size and if you go back to the finder here just like the explorer we see like the suspense bit has actually one one gigabyte awesome this is what we wanted to, to have was our objective so there's one last thing i would like to cover before we end this chapter so we we actually finalized uh, what we wanted to do we created we migrated our old create random files to this new a fake file generator and that's great we can actually use it as we wanted it to have it and that's fine but is this a good idea do we actually want to do it do we want to switch the usability of a function that our end users can use for one of a, of a class and I would say no we don't want to do that because if we do that there's a lot of added assets we remove uh, from our uh, end users so for example there's there's no comment based help in this section right and also people that have been using import module up until now if they want to uh, if you add this like in the module now and you want to call this class you have to use using module. And also here, this is, it's called new, but like this, this syntax is not very PowerShell-ish kind of. Huh? So what I would recommend is not to stop here. So we have, we are almost done, I would say, but really I would recommend to, um, to sum this up in new in a function so function new new fake files new fake file something like that i would say we will add some comment help i fill that in later and Basically, it should have this functionality. It should work just like that inside of here. And so if you do it like this, and I just add here like a short, uh, so generate random files with mean meaningful names of a specific total size and so now it would be possible for the user to go and use get help to find information about this function get help new fake file generate random file meaningful names of specific total size but also we have used this class and and this is really an advantage is because now our class will work kind of like an API and the function will kind of be something similar to um, to the like a front end we can say kind of and so if we need to change something how uh, for example set number of files is is working we can go ahead and change that directly in the class as long as we don't change how this method is called and the signature, it won't impact like the productive front end, so the pro productive function. So this way of um, of working, this is what I would really recommend: is if you have a class, always expose the functionality through a function, so that the user can use it using import module, so that the user can um, have comment based help and that there's a so this easy abstraction for him and that we as we the developers have this this advantage of of being able to use classes so that we can have
properties and methods and constructors to uh, make our lives easier. And so all we need to do is we need to add these parameters and add a param block. And for this, we're going to do the number of number number of files. So we're going to set that to one. Then set and also total size, and so that should be one megabyte. So here we need commas. And the last one is folder path is equal to PS script group. Right? So not total size here, that is number of files. Total size. Folder path. And that create. And that that's it. And so now so Now to call this, I'm going to do one last check and then I'm done. I'm going to let you go back to, to your own thing. So we're going to set the folder path to the folder path. Look here. Number of files we want to say, let's say, we want to have, I don't know, eight files and a total size of eight megabytes no not not eight let's say 32 megabytes why not and so files here is clean and so if we call this function here it's going to say nah it didn't work because because it is no so the path is no so what are we doing wrong folder path folder path Okay, pressing F5, this works better. We can see we have these files of this size, which actually represents or oh, reveal in Finder for the two. So that seems like correct to me. Okay, so to sum up, Migrating something, an existing script, an existing function to a class makes only sense if you actually want to add new functionality or if you need to refactor it for business reasons and um, or if the code is uh, needs to, to become cross-platform and like in this case, it, it would not work. If the code is working and you can continue to work with it like this, there's actually no reason to change it. Like a few years back, I would have said, yeah, yeah, go ahead, up, migrate it, but it's just a waste of time. If it works now, continue to using it like this. Only change it if you really need to. Second thing is that if you want to change it, I would recommend write it in a module. Put a class in the module. Expose the functionality of that class through methods and Add functionality to the to that class by adding methods and data on properties and expose that functionality to the end users using functions, just like I did here with the new fake file. Once you have that, this is something that I call personally, this is my own opinion, I call this a hybrid module. Why? Because we have a hybrid version. We have parts of it are classes, Parts of it are functions, and we expose like the functionality of the functions um, of the classes through functions, and we don't let the users call functions uh, methods directly on the classes. 
And that's what I call a hybrid module. So let's go back to the slides. So we're back in PowerPoint. We've seen the demo of how to convert a rather old script to a kind of like a new class. And at the end, I also mentioned that uh, it's better not to export the class directly like this. Do not offer the class to your end users as is, but expose the functionality of your classes using uh, methods via a function, right? And so this is an extract uh, here, this, uh, this, this slide of uh, a diagram I have on my second blog. I have the link underneath the image. I'd recommend you guys read that as well, where I kind of try to explain how this actually works. So uh, it, it's a good thing actually to have, so in this case, uh, it's the class computer. We have this class computer, which represents kind of like our API, let's say. It's a backend API. And we have this crop here, which is can be considered as private. It's not available to uh, external people when we use only import module. Import module will only export functions. The functions that are set in the functions to export. So in your PSD one, that's very important detail. If it's not in there, then it won't be exported and people, although they do import module, they, they won't see it. But you can add the, your class in that exports uh, functions to export your class will never be visible. That's that's how it is. It is by design. So to bypass this kind of is that you actually, in your public function, you call the functionality from your private class, right? Just like how we did in the for the uh, the, the fake uh, gener generator, right? The, the file generator. We have exposed the dot create method via a new function called new uh, fake file. So this new fake file would be over here and it is exported. And so when the person in his script does an import module, name of our module, and then script, fa fake file, sorry, then it would follow this path like here. And from here in this public area, this function has, actually since it's part of the same module, has access to that class, right? This is how you expose the functionality. And this, this structure here is what I call actually the hybrid module. It may be a good name, maybe a bad name. I'm happy to discuss it, uh, but I wanted to give it a name so at least we can point our finger to it. And once we have a beer and we discuss about how to structure a module and if somebody refers to a structure of a module instead of explaining what you're doing, just talk about the hybrid module and uh, you should actually stick that word on this image. I also talk about the, the same concept in a chapter I wrote for the PowerShell conference book, volume two. The chapter is called Tools and Methodologies for PowerShell Class uh, Developers. And I actually go even more in depth into this hybrid module concept and I explain how you can, how all the bits fit together, right? And so I would really recommend uh, to go and purchase this book uh, specifically because all the money goes directly to um, a nonprofit organization. So uh, please buy a copy. There's like Tons of other people that wrote an, uh, wrote uh, chapters in it, so it's it's actually very good, very good content. One last additional benefit of uh, writing classes is you can use uh, pre-existing tools because we talk always about trust uh, to generate or to do some additional things. And I have written another open source project called PS Class Utils, which does that for you. So. It generates uh, automatically pester tests for you. So all the pester tests for that particular class, and it, it will create uh, UML diagrams for you, right? So have a look at this link here I'm setting. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details simply for uh, the sake of saving some time. And also it's maybe beyond the scope of this, uh, this introduction uh, level of this, this, this course.
So it's the summary already. What have we learned actually up until now? What have we seen? So we had an introduction to classes. We covered the vocabulary. Theoretically, you guys should be more comfortable with what is a property, a method, a constructor. Keywords like this or void should be uh, clear now. Um, so we've seen the basics of classes. What is a, how do we construct uh, an instance of an object? How do we call methods, etc.? We've seen also the mistakes I made in my own projects, and hopefully uh, you've learned through my experience, uh, and you will hopefully not do the same mistake. I still recommend you guys try things out and make mistakes because that's actually how I think people learn things by doing themselves. At the end, we also converted a, an existing script to a class. Uh, we saw it's somehow straightforward. Uh, we just need to be prepared in advance and we need to know what our objectives are and where we want to go. Uh, we, uh, we also learn or realize that we should actually really write uh, actually our modules um, and our classes in it like an API and should expose the functionality of these kind of APIs through functions. And also like we learned that there's a magic benefit of using classes is that there are tools that exist. For example, in PS class utils, which would uh, add additional magic um, to your code and it will generate, for example, automatically pass the test for you and generate UML diagrams, which is pretty neat if you ask me. So that was it. Uh, that was my talk. Maybe it was very long. Uh, I invite you to go see my other my projects, PSHTML, PS Class Utils. Go see me on Twitter, Stefan VG. And that's it. Thank you very much. Weird times. And I hope I see you next year uh, in a real physical conference in, in Hanover. Okay, bye-bye.